Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, which is administered by US Aging. My name is Meredith Hanley. I serve as the Director of Community Capacity Building at US Aging and oversee the Engaged Resource Center. Our webinar today is called Serving Hispanic and Latino Older Adults and Caregivers, Creative Approaches for Social Engagement and Connection. During the webinar, MHP Salud will share cultural considerations when working with Hispanic and Latino older adults and caregivers, and will also share tips, strategies, lessons learned to help organizations create and implement social engagement opportunities. Then Vent Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, along with Berks County Area Agency on Aging and the Central Hispano Daniel Torres will then highlight social engagement programs and services they offer for Hispanic and Latino older adults and caregivers and discuss how other organizations can create and implement similar offerings. Next slide. We do have a few housekeeping items. All attendees on this webinar are in listen only mode for the duration of the webinar. So your microphone or phone will be muted, but there are ways you can engage with our speakers and with each other today. You can submit questions for the presenters at any time during the, during the webinar by clicking the Zoom question and answer or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you would just type your question into the Q&A box and submit it. There will be time for questions near the end of the webinar. So you are encouraged to submit questions that you have. There's also the chat feature, which I see some folks using already. You can click on the chat button to submit a message to, to us as the host also if you need technical support and we'll do our best to help you out. The webinar will be recorded and we will share a link with you in the next few days as well. Next slide. For those who are using a screen reader and perhaps want to silence unwanted chatter in the chat or Q&A boxes, you can activate the speech on demand feature by pressing insert space bar and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. Also, you can view closed caption subtitles, watch a live transcript of the meeting, or adjust the size of subtitle text to, to control um, closed caption. To control the closed captions, click on the CC Live Transcript button in the control bar at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, you can also notify us if you'd like technical assistance by raising your virtual hand. And, um, and you can use the Zoom platform to raise or lower your hand by pressing Alt-Y on your keyboard as well if you wish to do it that way. And then we would likely chat with you directly to see how we can help. Next slide. Before we move into our speakers and the heart of the webinar, I did want to share just a little bit of information about Engaged in case you're not familiar with our work or haven't attended one of these webinars before. Engaged is a national effort um, since 2017. It's funded by the Administration for Community Living, and we work to increase the social engagement of older adults, people with disabilities, and their caregivers. We focus on identifying, developing, disseminating resources, best and promising practices and hosting learning opportunities such as this webinar for the Aging Network and Aging Network partner organizations. Engaged is ad administered by US Aging and we're also guided by a project advisory committee with representatives from 18 organizations and resource centers who provide insights from their fields of expertise. Next slide. So with that, I wanna introduce our panel of speakers for today's webinar. We're joined by Shannon Patrick, a program director with MHP Salud, Monique Nolan, deputy director with, um, with um, like we have your a typo in, in, in your title there, Monique, so perhaps I'll allow you to introduce yourself fully there. Um, Jessica Jones, director with Berks County Area Agency on Aging, and Michael Toledo, president and CEO with Central Hispanic Daniel Torres. So with that, um, Shannon, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Shannon Patrick and I work at MHP Salud. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, I wanted to give a little introduction. Um, we're a national nonprofit organization that has implemented community health worker or CHW programs in underserved Latino communities for 39 years. We also promote the CHW profession nationally as a culturally appropriate strategy to improve health through national training and technical assistance opportunities. 
So we're also an ACL or administration for community living funded minority technical assistance resource center. And we're focusing on strengthening aging services for Hispanic and Latino communities. Next slide. So as part of this strengthening aging services program, <clears throat> we offer um, three objectives. The first is developing culturally and linguistically appropriate resources. We also provide training and technical assistance on a one on one basis, as well as through technical assistance calls. And then we also provide virtual learning opportunities in the form of webinars and learning collaboratives. And if you're interested in signing up for any of our free learning opportunities, I highly recommend you go ahead and check out our website where you can go ahead and sign up for those for free. Next slide. So with that said, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and just get started and provide a little overview of the Hispanic and Latino population um, of older adults here in the United States. Um, so I like this graphic because you can obviously see we're expecting uh, an increase in older people, uh, 65 and older in the coming years. And we're expecting to see a large increase in racial and ethnic minority populations of older adults. So between 2019 and 2040, white older adults are projected to increase by 29%, um, where other racial and ethnic minority groups are expected to increase by 115%. And if you look specifically at Hispanic older adults, that population is expected to increase by 161%, the, the, the quickest growing group of all of the racial and ethnic minority groups. So I wanted to point that out because these numbers show that, you know, we need to be prepared to, to serve <clears throat> diverse older adults um, and our programs need to reflect our changing communities. And we believe that using CHWs to reach these communities is a really great approach. Next slide. So um, I also just wanted to introduce that Hispanic and Latino older adults are a very diverse group. Um, we often use the term Hispanic to reference anyone from a Spanish speaking country. There's over 20 countries that speak Spanish. Latino or Latina refers to an individual who's from Latin America and Latinx is a gender inclusive term um, that we're seeing gaining popularity really among academics and youth, but it's not necessarily something our older adult communities have embraced um, at this moment. So it's important to know that these terms are often used interchangeably, but there are some differences. And there are larger subgroups within these groups that have their own cultural norms and beliefs. So it's really important that we don't overgeneralize and say, hey, we're serving Latinos, when in reality, there are subgroups with unique differences that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> So close to half of older Hispanic adults in the United States live in California and Texas. So if you can see here in this map, the green area is representing Hispanic and Latinos. Next slide. And I really liked this map because it also shows the second most prevalent racial and ethnic groups in the United States. So you can see that that green area is representing the second most prevalent group. So we can see Hispanics and Latinos are all over the United States and we really need to be prepared to serve this age, uh, this population as they're aging. Um, according to Pew Research Center, about a quarter of Hispanics live in multi-generational households. So that's grandparents, parents, grandchildren, all under one roof. Um, and we often see that more than one third of older Hispanic adults have more than one disability. So um, these you know, statistics can help us a little bit in preparing for the services that we'll provide for our Hispanic and Latino communities. And then also Hispanic older adults are more likely to live in poverty than other older Americans. And we see a lower educational attainment among this population and just about half of the population mainly speak Spanish. So, you know, we need to make sure that our services are reflective of this. And again, the population is growing, that we'll see one in five older adults um, will be Hispanic by the year 2060. So really planning ahead and making sure that we're inclusive in our services now will benefit us down the road. Next slide. And when we're thinking about important um, cultural um, values <clears throat> and influences, we really can think that each subgroup is going to be having, you know, their own unique values and influences. But one that is particularly common in most Hispanic and Latino communities is familismo or familism, which is this cultural value or concept of putting family needs above individual needs. And we can see this in the preference for family caregiving. There's often a desire among older Latinos, as with any older American, to age at home, but with a family care provider instead of uh, you know, another care provider that isn't related. <clears throat> 
Families often involved in decision making. It's not uncommon for older adults to seek input from their family members before making important decisions. And then when we're thinking of caregivers, it's often, you know, um, something that people uh, do, they feel a sense of purpose in caring for their older adult family members, but they're also less likely to identify as caregivers and prioritize themselves in self-care um, and seeking the support that they need. So these are some things that can help us when we're considering working with older adults in the Hispanic Latino community and their caregivers. Next slide. So as mentioned, when I introduced our organization, you know, we promote the community health worker profession. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, we've provided this slide with the in-depth description of what a community health worker is. It's provided by the American Public Health Association. For the sake of time, I won't read it, but we do like to summarize and just say that a CHW is a trusted member of their community who empowers their peers through education and connection to health and social resources. Next slide. And CHW or community health worker is also this umbrella term. So there are, are other professions that might fall within the scope of community health worker work. Many of you may have heard the term promotor, promotora de salud, um, patient navigator, outreach worker, community health advocate. These are just some names that, um, you know, um, of roles that might also be doing community health worker um, work in their communities. Next slide. And again, um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here about the community health worker role, but I would like to bring to your attention something called the C3 project or the CHW core consensus project. And it does a great job giving an overview of the different roles, skills and qualities that CHWs possess. Um, it's a national project that really aimed to identify a single set of CHW roles and competencies to really help provide a, and define the scope of CHW work at a national level. Next slide. And they provide 10 roles, 11 skills, <clears throat> and other qualities. So again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into detail here about all of these different CHW core roles, but I will identify a few when working with Hispanic and Latino communities that really benefit our organizations and the community members. Um, <clears throat> so when we're thinking about working with um, you know, vulnerable populations or individuals that have specific, you know, cultural needs or barriers, um, you know, having a, an individual to help with cultural mediation or really helping the organization understand common beliefs, norms, um, and then also that the community might experience to help improve their services. And they can also help community members really understand how they might benefit from an organization's um, services. Um, community health worker roles um, include conducting community outreach, providing care coordination or helping them understand and navigate our United States healthcare system, which is very complex and confusing for anyone. Um, and CHWs can really help individuals with that. And another role that I would say is really important is providing culturally appropriate health education and information. So this is in the language of the community, um, you know, the, of their preferred language um, with cultural competency in mind um, and, and, and a lot of ways to connect with those individuals. Next slide. And here's a list of the 11 CHW core skills um, that the C3 project has listed. Again, um, for core competencies and roles <clears throat> and skills, not all community health workers are gonna possess each one of these roles and skills, right? It's really gonna depend on the type of work that they're doing, but it's a great place to go if you're seeking and wanting to learn more about how to engage with older Latinos and their caregivers. And you can figure out, you know, is this position something that will fit with us? And, you know, who might, what skills might these individuals possess? And so again, there might be overlap with some of the roles I identified, outreach skills, for example, but CHWs also come to the organization with a strong knowledge base of their community, the needs of the community. Again, these are individuals serving their own communities. So they come from the communities that we're trying to reach. They also might know of you know, other trusted community-based organizations we can partner with. Um, <clears throat> next slide. 
And I just like this because it shows again, other core qualities. One thing that all CHWs must possess is a passion for serving their communities. So you can see here, compassionate, um, but there are other wonderful qualities that help make them become trusted members of your organization and build that trust um, in a community. So flexible, friendly, respectful, right? These are some qualities that they might possess. Next slide. So I encourage you check out the C3 Projects website. It's um, c3projects.org, I believe, um, and, and take a look. Um, but when we're thinking about community health workers, specifically in social engagement, um, you know, there are some things that really help us know whether or not this is a position that we want to be promoting within our organizations, right? CHWs are from the communities they serve. They look like the community members they, um, they're serving. They speak the language that the community speaks. And they really understand some cultural and situational barriers and influences, um, of the, again, of their communities. And so these individuals really help um, <clears throat> people feel welcome and understand uh, and understood within an organization. Um, CHWs also promote trusting relationships with community members. So again, they spend time asking questions, sitting down, supporting individuals, really learning about their situation um, and building relationships. So when an individual needs services in the future, they know they can reach back out to that CHW. They can also do this with other community-based organizations. So our CHWs are often out in, in the community, not only at health fairs or other events, but at other community organizations serving our communities. Um, so they're very valuable in helping us expand our reach. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, other CHW roles that are aligned specifically with social engagement, I would say outreach and education. So they're out, again, at these fairs, their faces are seen in the community. They start to build more trust. Um, they're providing culturally appropriate education and information. So we know that our materials and information is appropriate because we get that CHW input. You know, uh, maybe we use an eighth grade reading level for our flyers and materials and our CHWs can say, hey, you know what, um, actually, this is a little bit um, too complex for our um, community. Maybe we need to think about simplifying the language or using more images, for example, and really making sure that we're inclusive um, beyond just bilingual services. <clears throat> Cultural mediation, again, helping our organization understand the culture of the communities we're trying to serve and make sure that we are being inclusive in the way we're reaching individuals and the services we provide, social support, <clears throat> and then again, case management and systems navigation. So helping older adults realize, hey, you know, if you have Medicare, you actually do qualify for some of our services and this is how I can help you get set up and, and really taking that time to help people really understand their eligibility. Next slide. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if your organization doesn't have a community health worker program or contracted CHWs, you're really thinking about um, you know, implementing a program, there's certain things that we want to make sure people are thinking about before going ahead and starting that program. You know, are we prepared to serve a diverse community? Um, CHWs are not a one-size-fits-all solution. We really need to have the capacity at an organizational level. So we don't want to have a bilingual flyer and then have a bilingual or a Spanish speaker call and then not have the staff able to support that person, right? We want to make sure that we're prepared. So <clears throat> do we have bilingual materials? Um, are they at an appropriate reading level? Do we have bilingual and bicultural staff? Do our, com our community members going to feel welcomed when they come in here? Um, do we have the community trust? And if not, how do we begin to build that trust in these new organizations, uh, in these new communities that we're trying to, to reach? Um, who are our partners? Do we have strong community partnerships, which I believe we'll hear from later on, a perfect example, um, so that we're able to provide culturally appropriate services and refer if we can't provide those? Um, is our leadership on board? And then how can we integrate community health workers into our existing programs to kind of help make them a little bit more inclusive as well. So this is just kind of skimming the surface of community health worker programming. Um, next slide. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, please don't hesitate to send me an email um, and I'd be happy to meet with you or have a conversation. And that said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to our next speaker, Monique. Thank you so much. Hi, Shannon. Thank you. Thank Hello, everyone. Thank you, Shannon, for your time. Shannon provided a great foundation for me to build on. My name is Monique Nolan, and I'm actually the deputy director with the Ventura County 
area agency on aging and i'm going to be talking about some creative approaches that we have used for social engagement and connection next slide please So before you began your journey on deciding how you'd like to best serve the Hispanic and Latino older adult population and their caregivers, you want to understand the target audience. There are more than 20 different Spanish speaking countries in the world and all of them are represented in the United States, just like Shannon said earlier. So what in your area, you wanna ascertain what cultures are primarily represented in your area. Effectively communicating with a particular community must include more than material translated into another language, bilingual staff and bicultural staff. And what are trusted neighborhood venues that can have program and marketing material available? Effective communication includes establishing trust. There's that word again. For us, we're the trusted source for older adults in the community. So individuals or organizations that wanna get information about um, to our population come to see us. And so you wanna find out in your area, who are the trusted resources? Do you have staff members embedded in the community already that can reach your target audience in person to establish that trust? Next slide, please. The Ventura County Area Agency on Aging or VCAAA Senior Nutrition Program provides food and meal resources for local residents with targeted meal preparation for our diverse population that includes a diverse selection of produce from the VCAAA Nutrition Farm that is familiar to individuals in the Latino or Latina community. We also offer culturally appropriate meal options in cities with a predominantly Latino, Latina population. One specific example that we have is Brenda's Casamian Catering. It's a small restaurant in Piru, California, and serves as a gathering place for older residents to get both the nutrition they need and the companionship they crave from a locally trusted business owner. Sitting down for a daily meal with others eases their isolation and helps build a community while offering a nutritious meal. Uh, to give you some context, many Piru residents earn less than 60% of the state's median household income and 40% of the clients served by the county's area agency on aging, which is us, exhibited symptoms of high nutritional risk, with many saying that they don't have the money to buy nutritious food. And a quarter said they eat alone for most meals. So you can see how, what a valuable resource Brenda's Casamia and cater catering is for that community. And Brenda's Casamilla serves as one of the 11 community meal sites for the VCAAA's Senior Nutrition Program in which we have meal sites countywide. Next slide, please. Another way we reach out to our community for social engagement and, and connection is our Family Care Caregiver Resource Center, La Buena Vida. Local Family Caregiver Resource Centers, or FCRCs, provide assessment and case management for family caregivers living in Ventura County. There are three FCRCs in Ventura County that provide caregiver training, support groups, home adaptations and safety devices, a caregiver resource library and computer center, information and assistance, and community education for eligible family caregivers. It also helps caregivers with in-home respite, and out of home respite, in other words, adult daycare for caregivers at risk of caregiver burn burnout. And why La Buena Vida? La Buena Vida's primary service population is a monolingual Spanish speaking community with services also available in cities with a significant number of Latino or Latina residents, including Piru, which we just talked about with Brenda's Casamia, Fillmore, Santa Paula, Oxnard, and Ventura. Service efforts are often focused on, one, identifying family caregivers as they often do not see themselves as caregivers, as Shannon talked about earlier. Many of us think, oh, we're just, I'm just talking, I'm an adult child, I'm taking care of my mom or dad, but I'm not really a caregiver. So it's important to help them identify as family caregivers and providing in-person resources to effectively build trust and connect with each client. Next slide, please. Another way we reach out into our community is um, our expanded online resources. Never has the contrast become more stark for the digital divide as when we had um, the pandemic, which of course is still ongoing. The VCAAA recognizes the gap in digital services for many of Ventura County's 
older adults and individuals living with a disability. And for that reason, VCAAA has established a variety of programs directed at bridging the digital gap and making digital devices and services more accessible to those who need them most. Um, two specific ways we're addressing that need are VC Connects. So VC Connects offers individuals 18 years and older access to computer kits that can be checked out at any of the 12 Ventura County Library locations or the mobile library. They have internet enabled hotspots. Um, they've got the actual Chromebook. There's a headset, um, all available in, in, a, in a nice carrying kit that they can check out. The program is offered through a collaborative effort between the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, the County of Ventura Information and Technology Department, who helped us decide what to put into these kits, and of course, the Ventura County Library. It's about leveraging your, your networks, your agencies, your partnerships for getting materials out to the community. The Ventura County Library is a trusted source. Why would I reinvent the wheel and check them out when I can leverage my partnership with the library? And we also have Get Set Up. So Get Set Up teaches older adults to use technology in a way that is comfortable and supportive. The platform helps to address the social determinants of health by assuring older adults and that, that stay connected to the tools that they need to thrive and age in place. So Get Set Up offers live interactive learning experiences that range from everyday technical skills to enrichment focused activities and courses, including healthy cooking, virtual travel, and more. And all the learning opportunities are taught by live, are taught live by experts who are also older adults themselves, and many of the courses are available in multiple languages. Next slide, please. So here you will find our resource guide. It's called Live Well. It's online as well as hard copy. And every year we try to keep our finger on the pulse point of the community in our county. And so the articles change as well as the cover. This year we thought it's with the master plan for aging and the bold goals and individuals thinking about how they want to optimally age. We decided to call this the subcategory, if you will, piecing together the services that you need to age well in Ventura County. So this research is available digitally on our website at VC. AAA.org. I look forward to your questions during the Q&A and after the webinar. If you have questions, please reach out to Victoria Jump at victoria.jump at ventura.org. She's our director or myself, the deputy director at um, of Monique Nolan, monique.nolan at ventura.org. Thank you for your time. And I'm going to introduce um, next speaker, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Monique. That was very uh, insightful and a lot of great programs. Uh, I'm the director for the Berks County Area Agency on Aging, and I have with me today um, Mike Toledo, who is a great partner and uh, a great force within our community for the Latino population. And I just wanted to kind of set the landscape for what our area agency on aging does here in Berks, in Berks County in Pennsylvania, and then kind of give Mike a lot more opportunity to talk about exactly their programs and services that they're providing. So we're one of 52 area agencies on aging in Pennsylvania. We're funded federally. Um, and we also we see, receive mostly state funding through our block grant, which actually allows us to have some more flexibility around spending and our ability to uh, develop partnerships and programs and things like what Mr. Toledo will be talking about shortly. Uh, in Shannon's presentation, she showed the need and the changing communities. So understanding sort of Berks County and Reading, uh, you'll see that of Berks County, 22.5% of the population is Hispanic or Latino. Um, Reading is the fifth largest city in Pennsylvania. And one of the presentations I actually saw at um, the uh, Centro Hispano quite a while ago, it was probably pre-COVID, uh, Mr. Toledo had a presentation and the speaker was talking about the Reading School District and the amount of uh, 
Hispanic or Latino individuals that are attending the Reading School District. And I think it was around 96% of the children attending there. So uh, you can understand and kind of get the, the landscape of Reading and just generally Berks County and what those needs are. So what we do as a, a overall provider and the contractor of services, we provide some direct services, but things like the senior centers uh, and food services are, are a integral part of what the uh, Centro Hispano Daniel Torres provides for us, uh, the senior center called Casa and uh, Mike will talk a little more about that. We also have some other services that allow us to have some additional breadth and depth for just general programming, our in-house interpretation. We actually have live interpreters that are in-house for our, our workers uh, and Mr. Toledo and his organization provide that to us on an almost daily basis. Uh, we also have a medical interpretation program, which, Mike, I couldn't remember how many years ago we developed that program, but it's been quite a few years. Um, and I know he's expanded upon that, in, that program, and I'll let him talk about it. But basically, when, when we sat down and talked about developing this program, the goal of it was to actually engage individuals and get them comfortable with going to their doctor's office visits, having an interpreter present for them because that was something that our local hospitals did not have uh, on a routine basis in some of the individual doctor's offices. So the point of it was to actually allow some additional uh, supports for these people so that it would encourage them to continue to see their physician and gain that trust and be more medically compliant and healthier overall. So, so Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate uh, the intro. You know, in terms of, you know, the work that we're doing at uh, Mama Angie's Casa de la Amistad, you know, we view ourselves as an anchor organization in our community. Uh, we are the organization that our community goes to um, for information, for guidance, for direction. We've been serving in that capacity for over 50 plus years. Uh, so that has helped us, obviously, to be seen and viewed um, as a trusted source of information. And I think that's what um, helps us a great deal when it comes to our, our senior services and what we're doing at the Senior Center. So I'll take some time to just talk about a little bit about what we do, programming that we do at the Hispanic Center, um, at Casa La Amistad uh, Senior Center. And then speak to, I think, what, what's important for organizations that, that want to start doing this work or that see the need for wanting to start doing this work around uh, diversity and, and, and cultural competency and what it takes for an organization to meet the needs of diverse populations. We'll speak a little bit to that. So if, if we can go next slide. So again, since 1988, um, Angie's uh, Casa La Mista, which stands for Friendship House, uh, has been um, the source uh, for information, for programming to our senior population. Again, we know that when it comes to our seniors, many of them live uh, in isolation. And we know that, you know, our seniors that live in isolation uh, could lead to depression. You know, depression leads to mental illness. So to, to have a place that they can call home, a second home, a place where they can come to be with their peers, where they can come to get program and services, uh, a nutritional meal, uh, to participate in activities that are culturally relevant to, to them and that, that show that we value them it is important. And th those are the things that we provide at Casa de Amistad. Next slide, please. Um, so again, um, at CASA, pre-pandemic, we were probably uh, seeing anywhere from 175 to 200 seniors a day that would come to our senior center uh, for congregate meals, for programming. Since the pandemic, um, obviously it, it has grown uh, to over 300 seniors that we're serving in a hybrid setting. So we have seniors that are coming to the senior center, uh, but we also have seniors that due to the pandemic are afraid to come out or their families don't want them to go out. So we wanted to continue to connect with them. 
let them know that we value them, let them know they're special. So we try to provide services to them where they are um, in their homes so that we can stay uh, connected to them. Uh, again, all, all our seniors uh, that participate in our programming are 60 years of age and older. Um, and again, there's no charge for them to, to, to participate. We do accept donations, but again, all seniors um, are welcome. Next slide, please. Again, as Jessica mentioned, you know, we, we couldn't do the work that we do if it wasn't for the, the financial support and the funding we, we receive from the Berks County Area Agency on Aging. Again, the, the way we talk about it here locally is, you know, between Casa de Amistad and the Berks County Area Agency on Aging, we want to put our arms around the seniors uh, that we serve so that no matter where they look or they turn, uh, they see us there uh, providing them the support and services that they need to, to live a comfortable and fruitful for life. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, some of the services uh, that, that we provide, again, information and referral, uh, individual case management. So our seniors can come to us every day and we have service coordinators and case managers um, that are, are ready for them to address any concern or issue that they may have. And from day to day, you never know what, you know, what we may hear from our seniors. Um, it could be as simple as they receive the letter in the mail and need someone to help translate this letter. Um, to as significant as, you know, again, they have a, a, a daughter that's being uh, abused by, by their, their husband and they need services, who can help? So we just never know, but our service coordinators and case managers are, are, are knowledgeable and equipped to have the resources that we need, that if we can't help directly with the services that are needed, we can connect them to services in the community uh, that can help um, our seniors with whatever. Uh, whatever concerns or issues they may have from a case management perspective. Um, all of our case managers are bilingual, bicultural, um, so that we can help them in, in whatever language they're comfortable in, whether it's English or Spanish, uh, we're able to, to meet that need and meet them where they are. Again, group activities. We've talked about the various group activities that we may have uh, from congregate uh, meals together, uh, to, to uh, arts and crafts, you know, the usual kind of activities that, uh, that you, you'll find at, at a senior center, um, the health and wellness activities, um, the arts and crafts, um, the ESL programming, uh, the computer lab. Um, these are all different things that the services that we have within uh, our, our senior center within Casa de Amistad. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, I mentioned the, the, uh, the computer classes, uh, the exercise time. I mean, if, there, if anything has really stood out, our health and wellness is so critically important, especially for our seniors. And uh, with the pandemic of the last couple of years, uh, the Hispanic Center played a critical role of trying to fill the gap uh, and, and build bridges to connect our underserved senior population when it came to the pandemic and vaccinations, uh, where we vaccinated close to 5,000 in our community that uh, again, where there was a barrier uh, to access to the vaccines, um, the Casa Amistad played a very important role with the Area Agency on Aging to make sure that our seniors had access uh, to, to vaccinations. Um, next slide, please. Again, we talked about the meals. Uh, here in Berks County in, in Reading, it's, it's interesting. I know Jessica talked about of the meals and 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 and, and uh, heard our, our other community partners earlier talk about the meals here in Berks County. We serve we have a Latino population, Hispanic population, but we also have a, a vibrant Pennsylvania Dutch uh, community. So it's it's funny we're we're always hearing we have we have on this side you know oh we want more rice and beans and and on this side we want we want more mashed potatoes and sauerkraut and so. It's always finding that happy medium to meet the needs of, of the diversity that we have in our senior population. Um, but we're serving many meals uh, a day uh, to across population. Uh, uh, and and we're, we're happy to be able to do that for our seniors. Next slide, please. Again, besides the congregate meals we provide, again, we are the primary vendor for Meals on Wheels in the city of Reading. Next slide, please. Again, so you know, we're all, always putting on 
different type of cultural events to again take in, advantage of, 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 of our seniors that are there. So for example, we'll do Cinco de Mayo uh, events. We'll celebrate, again, uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day. And we'll, we'll look at what, what the type of events make, are important to them in our, in, in, in our, in our culture and the cultures that we, of the consumers that we have. And we, we celebrate, we highlight, we, we lift them up and in doing so make them feel good about activities. Uh, and events that, that take place at the center. Next slide. Uh, again, very similar. You see, we have a lot of fun um, at the senior center. They love the activities that we have. Not a holiday that goes by that we're not celebrating and embracing uh, the diversity of, of the culture and the traditions that we have. Next slide. Again, just to, within the numbers, we're, you know, we we're preparing about 9,000 meals monthly uh, for the community. Uh, information and referral appointments that we're seeing monthly, about 100. Um, senior food boxes, in um, partnership with our, uh, the food bank is about 450 meals. And Jessica mentioned our medical interpreting appointments. So we have about 20 to 30 medical appointments a month where we're, we're bridging the gap of social determinants of health. We know that the issues of transportation, language barrier, and we, we look to break those barriers to make sure health and wellness is important through our medical interpreting. And I mentioned the role the Hispanic Center played in providing vaccinations to our seniors uh, to the tune of about 5,000 members of our community. Next slide. Uh, again, and excited to share that, uh, you know, we are expanding. Uh, the need is, is, is great. And we're very blessed and fortunate that we'll have a new location, a larger um, a facility to be able to handle the congregate meals, um, some additional space for us to do our information referral and health and wellness activities. You can see we're, 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 we're in flux right now. The floors will go down uh, and walls next week. And we hope to be in our new location uh, July 1. Next slide. That's all. Here's our contact information if you have any additional questions for myself or for Jessica. But one thing I wanted to end on was, you know, for organizations that really want to step up and do the work around cultural competency, you know, there are, there are levels to get there. And I think that's important to share. You know, there, there are four types of, of, of cultural knowledge uh, and concepts that I think are important. There's cultural knowledge, meaning that you know something about the cultural characteristics, the history of the consumers that you serve. Uh, but that next level uh, is cultural awareness, right? That's the next stage of understanding uh, the seniors that you have and being open to the idea of the changing cultural um, attitudes. So from knowledge to awareness, the next level is cultural sensitivity. And that's really knowing the differences between the cultures and not assigning any kind of value to the differences, better or worse, right or wrong. I can tell you in our community having um, seniors that are from the Caribbean and Puerto Rico or from the Dominican Republic or from Mexico, different cultures, uh, different ideas. Um, and it's important to understand that cultural sensitivity. So going from cultural knowledge to cultural awareness to cultural sensitivity, the goal is to get to cultural competency, right? That's bringing all those, those previous stages together and then adding operational effectiveness to your programming and to the work that you do. So again, very important to understand that there is a way to get to where you want to get to. It's not enough to just be knowledgeable about it or be being aware. It's about the sensitivity to it and understanding there's a, there's a competence piece that's so critically important. And I'll, I'll leave you with the, the five uh, essential principles that I think are, are critically important if you're looking to do programming because of diversity within the community that you serve. Number one, you have to value diversity, right? accepting and respecting the differences between and within culture. So valuing diversity is key. Number two, important to conduct cultural self-assessments. We do it at the Hispanic Center um, every year. And we've been doing this for 20 plus years. So conducting cultural self-assessments around, you know, again, what, what, what are you doing now with your organizations? Uh, what, what should you be doing? Understanding the demographics that you have in your community. Once you can do a self-assessment, then you can realize kind of where you go from there. Number three, understanding the dynamics of difference. Many factors can affect cross-cultural interactions 
So again, understanding the dynamic of difference, as I mentioned with what we have to deal with here locally with our uh, uh, populations from different Latin countries and cultures, okay? Number four, institutionalizing cultural knowledge, okay? Cultural knowledge should be integrated into every facet of the organization, from staff getting trained to the, the not product knowledge that you need. Policies should be responsive to cultural diversity. And lastly, adapting to diversity, adapting to the values, behaviors, the attitudes, the practice and the policy. So again, hopefully you'll find this information helpful. Again, I'm going to uh, pass on uh, the, the, the presentation to Meredith. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share what we do and know that we all are a phone call away if there's ever need for additional help or support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of the speakers, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to say with, with some of those takeaways there at the end, Mike, that was really, really good. We do a blog after each of our webinars to help synthesize some of the key takeaways. So keep your eyes out for that, that we link to them in our newsletter, but also on our website, but we'll make sure to um, re re recap and, and summarize um, those elements at, at the end, which were really helpful. Before we move into questions, I wanna just do a quick highlight of a couple of resources through Engaged and another project at US Aging as well that ties into this. Um, Engage's newest publication is called What Works? Social Engagement Innovations and Best Practices. It highlights a roughly dozen programs that employ a variety of social engagement interventions and tap into a variety of partners at the local level to reach those consumers all across the country with, with social engagement programming. So I just wanted to mention that that's available on our website and our website link will be on the next slide, but don't go there quite yet, Ellie. <laughs> um, but all the programs highlighted in that what works um, document are also included in our innovations hub which is a searchable online clearinghouse available on the engaged website that you may wish to peruse as well. Um, and we are also um, always accepting new submissions to the social engagement innovations hub. So again, you may wish to peruse our website, check out some of these, these resources. Um, other things that we have include um, toolkits and template materials and videos and consumer brochures. And we also do a monthly newsletter and blog as, as I mentioned. Next slide. So this slide just highlights our contact information. I can also put it into the chat to make sure that you have it handy. Um, but, but if you Google engagingolderadults.org, you will then get directed to all of these other our social media, and you can also find our email address on our website as well. Next slide. I also wanted to mention another initiative um, that, that US Aging now has a lead role with, but Commit to Connect is a campaign developed by the Administration for Community Living to combat social isolation and loneliness experienced by older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers. And the aim of this initiative um, specifically is to foster a nationwide network of champions at the local, state, and national levels who are committed to addressing social isolation and loneliness. So through this initiative, there are online discussions and there's also a newsletter and also um, communities of practice, which is opportunities for people to come together and learn and share in a specific topic, peer networking opportunities. This initiative is also funded by the Administration for Community Living, ACL, and U.S. Aging was actually recently announced as the coordinating center for the Commit to Connect initiative. The URL is on the website here. Um, again, can place it in the chat, but basically it, it's, it's a, another um, resource for helping to address isolation and loneliness and comes with a wealth of resources, but also those peer networking opportunities specifically. Next slide. So we now have some time for Q&A. I've been seeing questions come into the, the Q&A box. So that's really good. We'll do our best to get to as many as possible. I will invite the speakers. You can all turn on your webcams. You can please go ahead and do that. Um, and we will just jump right in. So Shannon, there were a couple questions for you about community health workers. I was gonna try to combine them into one question, it's, it's a big topic. So I know they'll, and there may be more resources you would direct people to, to, to learn more, but can you tell us more about the screening and training for community health workers? Are they certified positions? 
And then any info you have about compensation of community health workers or how community health worker programs tend to be funded as well would be really helpful. Yeah, this is a great question and one that we get all the time. Um, so community health workers, I'll, I'll start with the certification process because that's a little complex. Um, so community health workers are not like nationally, there's no national certifying body for community health workers. So each state is going to have um, potentially a, an organizing body or CHW association or something along those lines that, um, you know, will determine whether or not that state has a certification or not. So many states do not have any certification at all, while others do. For example, in the state of Texas, there is a CHW certification available. Um, with that said, it shouldn't prevent CHWs from doing their work, but it creates a little bit more work for organizations to find training um, and support for those CHWs. So MHP Salud, for example, we do offer CHW training. It's comprehensive. It's three levels across a couple weeks. Um, so CHWs do get um, you know, comprehensive training and should be getting training on some of those core roles and competencies that I, that I shared with you in the training. Um, because the community health worker profession has been changing and, you know, over the last few years, there is more of a national understanding of the role. Um, there is, it has been more funding. For example, they've seen a ton of research to support that CHWs are doing amazing work with getting older adults vaccinated and getting Hispanic and Latino communities vaccinated, for example. Um, at one point in, I believe it was North Carolina, we saw higher rates of vaccines among Hispanic and Latinos because of the uh, work that CHWs and promotores de salud were doing. Um, so there's a lot of benefit to them. And so there has been a little bit more funding for federal um, programming, especially through the American Rescue Plan. Unfortunately, um, most community health worker programs um, are funded through grants. Um, and oftentimes research as well. So it can be challenging to have a, a continual program. And that's something that we're advocating for nationally. And, and I know that people are doing that within the states. And I'm I open for any presenters to share a little more if they have CHWs. Um, but I do know, I, I spoke with Victoria, so Monique, feel free to add anything on um, that. You know, I know that some AAAs are subcontracting with local um, you know, community-based organizations serving Hispanics and Latinos, so they may not have their own CHW program built in, um, but they might be having those CHWs doing outreach and then engaging with the community through promoting their, you know, their health um, education programs. Um, some of the programming that she mentioned was through Title 3D, so that's disease prevention and health promotion, um, and then potentially through caregiver intervention programs through ADPI. Um, and then potentially Medicaid um, can fund and reimburse some of these um, services. And so, you know, ultimately the goal would be to have your own CHWs, but that's definitely a place to start. Um, and that's in California. Mm -hmm. If you have questions about your particular state, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk with you a little more about, um, you know, what's available in your state for certification and how funding might work. Um, but it is a little bit complex. I will say that it, it's not um, super easy but um, it can be built into your plan and into your existing funds potentially. So I'll, I'll let Monique add on or anybody yeah. else. And I'll jump in. Gosh, Shannon, thank you. you did such a, a great explanation of, of how we use promotores and promotores. But if you have questions specifically about how we initiated that relationship, how we leverage that relationship, how we partner, please um, email me. Love to talk to you more about it. Jessica, did you want to jump in or Mike? You don't have to, but I just wanted to double check. Okay. No, we're good. I mean, there are, we know that there, there are uh, community health workers in our community, um, but not uh, part of the Hispanic Center, but we do collaborate and, and partner to meet the needs of, of the seniors uh, that we serve. S super, thank you. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, another question came in, a terminology question. Could you speak to terminology used when speaking to Spanish speaking caregivers, the term Cuidador has been used in um, this person's local area agency on aging, but they were curious if there are other terms used around the country that folks relate to or identify with. And um, Jessica or Mike, would you like to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I think there, there are multiple ways that, uh, again, they're identified in, in our community. Again, it's going to be culturally. 
again, what they may uh, call them in, in, in the South or uh, in the West is gonna be different than, than, than here in, in the Northeast. Again, it's, it's really a question, it's, it's a matter of terms of endearment, uh, in terms of they know, like, uh, you know, when they come to the, to the Hispanic Center, they know that our case managers, our service coordinators are, are there to help to, uh, to, to meet their need. Um, so again, there, there is no one size fits all, just like you've heard us in this presentation, you've heard Latino, you've heard Hispanic, um, again, you've heard Latinx. So again, it's, it, it's, there is no one size fits all, but one thing that, 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 that does shine through, you show them that they're valued, you show them that, that, we, that we care, um, they, you know, again, they respond to that um, and, and they feel that. They know that. They, they, they know genuine, uh, genuineness when they, when they see it. Thank you. The questions are pouring in. It's always hard to decide which ones to get to first, but um, another question came in, uh, and I think this one's, you know, anybody could chime in on this, but could you recommend certain stakeholders that organizations should be targeting as they look at developing partnerships, um, again, focused on the Spanish speaking community? And are there strategies that you use to kind of draw the attention or engage these partner organizations and communities? Um, Monique, would you like to start with that one? Sure, sure. Okay. Definitely, I'd like to um, take it back to Mike's comment about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I would say re reach out to your local DEI network organization for uh, if you're not already sure of who to collaborate with. Look in your own network or individuals that you work with. Um, the, that would be the the best way. And I'm a firm believer in social media kits when there's. Part of the question I believe was asking how to get the word out or get toward uh, get information to that community. I like a social media kit because we're all busy, right? So why reinvent the wheel? You create the social media kit with the language you want to use for their Instagram, their Twitter, their website, pictures, information. If you can already have it translated in the requisite language, even better, so that they can copy and paste, paste and, and share that information. And that'll help get the word out into the community because many times, not everybody's on uh, social media. So you want to leverage all networks. I, as I told you earlier, I have a hard copy magazine. I, I, I communicate various forms, but just because I'm using social media, maybe that person will tell somebody else and they go, oh, I heard about it on the website or somebody told me about this, that, and the other. So it's really important to look in your own backyard, try to be innovative and creative with who you can reach out to. And if you're not sure, try one of those diversity, equity, and inclusion task force, work groups, whomever in your community. So that's my, that's my two cents. That's great. Um, Another, oh, Mike, do you want to jump in? Real, real quick, it. just one of the things that we do here um, at the Hispanic Center, we have our own radio show. So radio is uh, again, a great opportunity for you. Uh, there's not a, a, a nail salon or a bodega or, you know, that, that has a Spanish language radio on. Um, now, locally, we have some community uh, radio stations through, through some colleges. So again, look into your areas if you have colleges. Uh, or universities that might have radio stations, that might be a great way to get programming on just to complement uh, what Monique shared. And again, the churches, let's not forget about the churches. The faith-based community is very strong, especially among Latino seniors. So the churches are, are great partners and they're always looking for ways to collaborate and partner. Thank you. And Shannon, I see you raised your hand too, so jump in. Just one addition, I would say, you know, thinking long term, you know, we want to make sure that our organizations are, are being building inclusion in long term, that we have a plan. So inviting some of these culturally, you know, community based culturally appropriate organizations to sit on your advisory committees and building a relationship so that so that so that you're thinking long term. And I'd like to add one closing comment that Mike made me think of also remember that not all language is written we have a growing mistake population and they their language is not written so everything that i um put together here at, for our agency is orally delivered um uh, either either on a on a radio show or on our website so just keep that in mind too about your populations wow there's a lot of 
I feel like this conversation should, could, and should just go, keep on going, but I also want to be respectful of everybody's time and our hour is up. So, um, I want to thank the speakers for your really amazing presentations that that was so appreciated for those of you attending this webinar. There is a very brief poll, um, survey that we use to gather feedback on um, these types of events that you'll, it'll just pop up as you close out of Zoom. It'll probably take two minutes of your time, maybe less. It's very brief. Um, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, we'd really appreciate it. We also do a three month touch point survey, also very, very brief, but it helps us look at longer term impact of these types of learning opportunities. And we, um, we use that information to th then further help shape our work. Um, and again, we, we will do a place of recording on our website along with a copy of the slide deck and you'll be getting an email with, with a link to that. Um, if you have any questions, you'll be able to contact us, just Google engagingolderadults.org. That information was also in the chat, so hopefully you have it handy. Um, but again, you'll be getting that follow-up email from, from us as well. So thank you again to the presenters and, and all of the attendees for sharing a little time with us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, bye.